the uh, 1994 Lou Douglas Lecture Series, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to the third part of our four-part series. Uh, tonight, we're fortunate to have Kenneth Davis uh, here to speak to us. Uh, my name is Justin Kastner. I'm a, a student intern with the 94 Lecture Series, and uh, we've been really excited about this series. If, I would like to refer you to your brochures right now. We've had two speakers already this fall. And uh, Jerry Manor will be here on the, November the 14th. I would encourage you to come back for that to close out uh, this, this 94 year. Uh, this is the 15th year we've had the Lou Douglas Lecture Series. And we have it in honor of Lou Douglas, a very uh, uh, contributing and very uh, excellent uh, political science professor here at K-State. And at this time, I'd like to uh, welcome, and in his honor, uh, his widow, uh, Mrs. Douglas. Mrs. Douglas? At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Dean Hall. Dr. Hall is the uh, head of the English department here at K-State. He's been the head of the department for four years. Uh, Dr. Hall received his doctorate after receiving his bachelor's, his bachelor's and master's degree at the uh, University of Northern Iowa. Uh, he went on to get his doctorate, as I said, at the University of Kent State University. And it was there that he spent a lot of time uh, studying. He went on to become a director of the technical writing program at Wayne State and at Detroit, at the University of Detroit. Uh, he was in charge of the professional writing project at the University of Detroit. And then in 1983, he came into his own and came to K-State. And uh, he's been here since then. And as I said, he's been head of the department for four years. Uh, before I ha have him come up here, I'd like to encourage you to stay uh, here after the after his after uh, Kenneth Davis's speech, we'll have a question and answer session, and that proves to be one of the most uh, enlightening portions of this of this lecture. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Dean Hall. I am honored tonight to introduce Professor Ken Davis. Honored indeed to share the same stage in such a prestigious lecture series as the Lou Douglas Lectures, especially in a series on the politics of culture, the speakers, to be believed, must have the breadth of interest, the multiplicity of training, and the in-depth understanding of our culture to deliver the goods. One has to know well the culture, how it has developed, as well as where it is now. And one has to understand American politics and the forces that drive it. Professor Ken Davis does know the culture and he is an acknowledged expert in American politics. He is an ideal choice for this Lou Douglas lecture, and as you will witness in just a few minutes, you're in for a real treat. Professor Davis is well poised to comment on American culture, in part because of the diversity of careers he has enjoyed. Ken Davis is one of KSU's own graduates and has, as well, a Master of Science degree from the University of Wisconsin. He has been a newspaper reporter, war correspondent, instructor of journalism, special assistant to Ms. Milton Eisenhower when Milton was president here at Kansas State, visiting professor of history here, adjunct professor of history at KU, as well as, and this is one of my favorite, adjunct professor of English at Clark University. <laughs> professor Davis is most well known, however, for his remarkable outputs of books and the diversity of that output. He has written three novels, In the Forest of the Night, The Years of the Pilgrimage, and Morning in Kansas. He has written River on the Rampage. It's an essay on river development and what he calls river thinking. He co-authored Water, the Mirror of Science. His biographies of famous Americans include Soldier of Democracy on Dwight Eisenhower, A Prophet in His Own Country, and The Politics of Honor, both on Adlai Stevenson, and The Hero on Charles Lindbergh. As an historian, however, Professor Davis is best known for his monumental and ongoing biography of Franklin Roosevelt. He has completed the first four volumes, FDR, The Beckoning of Destiny, FDR, The New York Years, FDR, The New Deal Years, and FDR, Into the Storm, which dealt with America's entry into World War II. These last two volumes were recognized by the New York Times Book Review as the among the 10 best nonfiction books of the year 
when they appeared. The fifth volume on FD FDR is close to completion, and as Ken told me on another occasion, it is the most difficult because in it he has to assay the meaning of FDR to make sense out of the hundreds of thousands of facts that he knows about Roosevelt. This task, the meaning-making task, is of course why historians write history and why we read history. We are fortunate tonight to have Professor Davis here to make sense out of another phenomenon, the effect that advertising has on the mass media. As an epigraph to one of his volumes on FDR, Professor Davis quoted Henry Adams, quote, modern politics is at bottom a struggle not of men, but of forces. The men become every year more and more creatures of force massed about central powerhouses, unquote. Tonight, Professor Davis is going to identify one of those forces, one of those central powerhouses. He has noticed a disquieting influence of the mass media to affect politics, perhaps even corrupt politics. To explain to us, to give meaning to those relationships between advertising, the mass media, and politics is Professor Davis's task tonight. The title of his talk is Mass Communications and the American Democracy. Please help me welcome Professor Kenneth S. Davis. Well, thank you very much. I propose tonight <clears throat> to argue that mass communications as presently managed and controlled in this country, and especially the electronic media, radio and TV as currently managed and controlled, constitute a grave threat to the survival of the United States as a free democratic society. I propose to discuss the nature of this threat, why and how it has arisen, the general outlines of a possible solution to the crucial problem it raises, if indeed at this late date the, the problem is soluble, and some first steps that might be taken toward this perhaps uh, possible solution. But before I begin my argument, <clears throat> I should make clear, I think, my conception of the freedom and the free democratic society, which is, in my view, so gravely threatened. I'm reasonably sure that, that my conception is in general outline the same as yours. It rests, however, upon an assumption whose implications, as I see them, have not been generally recognized uh, by Americans and so have not been generally acted upon. This assumption is that the individual human person is the center and measure of all value, and hence the proper source of all government, all governmental activity and authority. Every single man and woman, asserts our Declaration of Independence, is endowed by his creator with certain inalienable rights. These, however, can only be secured through government. Governments are instituted, says the, the, uh, says the Declaration, uh, to secure them. But this government must be of a certain kind. It must exercise only just powers. And the only just powers are those that derive from the consent of the governed. In other words, though freedom is a quality of individual persons, not of people en masse. And though a free society is one in which individual men and women are free, this freedom can be secured only through cooperation of people en masse through government. Now, it's re with regard to the, to the latter part of this implication, the part that has to do with the need for cooperation through government that we Americans have, I think, gone sadly wrong. We have gone wrong because we have based our action upon a disastrously limited conception of human nature, of the human person, of individuality, of, of individualism, and consequently of the nature of human freedom. Our conception has been an essentially spatial one. Following John Locke's lead, we have defined the human person primarily 
as an energized body occupying space. <clears throat> a tightly wrapped package of energy with the wrapping impenetrable, having properties, as, as John Locke called them, which are also sharply defined. We have generally viewed the individual person as, a, as an entity utterly unique, wholly itself, exclusive of all else. And like, like Locke and, and, and Adam Smith have concluded that individual self-interest, selfishness, is and must be the ultimate motivation of all human behavior. The self-interest should be enlightened, of course. It must take into account the self-interest of other people. But the purpose of such light is to show the way to the best possible fulfillment of one's own private desire, one's own distinctively individual fulfillment. As for freedom, human freedom, it is equated with independence and self-sufficiency, the latter being assured by private property. There are, of course, larger and smaller freedoms, with freedom itself being thus defined in spatial terms. This is where enlightened self-interest comes in. Once one enlarges his freedom, his ultimate independence, by joining with his fellows in a social compact whence government emerges. His motive for doing so is wholly prudential. It is self-interest intelligently perceived and exercised. It is enlightened selfishness. And this conception of the human, uh, but this conception of the human person, which has become, alas, so much the, the American conception, makes a human being, leaves out of account practically all that makes a human being uh, truly human, all that distinguishes him from an appetite-driven animal. The concept is far too limited, too exclusive, too materialistic, in its definitions. The individual person is spatial, of course, but he is also temporal. He lives in space, but he lives through time. He is not only physical, but also spiritual. And it is the temporal spiritual that is the truly vital dimension. The human person must therefore be viewed not as a completed entity, but as a process a continuous becoming, essentially identical with the, with the path that follows or forges through space-time. He must be seen as a stream of being connected with the environment in somewhat the same way as a river is connected by a, a web of water with the land through which it flows, which is to say that the living self actively involves its environment. It internalizes its environment while being also marginally and continuously absorbed into that environment. Now this is obvious as regard uh, the physical aspects of ourselves, our bodies. We internalize our physical environment when we drink water, breathe air, and eat food. And we as bodies become ourselves earth when we die. But environmental internalization is equally true of us in the spiritual dimension, ourselves as minds, as sentient, passionate human beings. We internalize our social and cultural environment when we read books and periodicals, listen to talk, view television. And we are continuously absorbed into that environment as our minds form connections with other minds and through our own individual expressions, help shape and become part of a common mind, of a, a public mind. Connectedness, says Whitehead in his modes of thought, connectedness is of the essence of all things. No fact is merely itself. Which is to say that our connectedness, one with another, is, is of the essence of our individual selves. And this leads to the conclusion that human freedom is not at all 
the kind of exclusive independence, the kind of private property that Jefferson unfortunately implied in the natural, natural rights language that, that he used in the Declaration. Far from being a property of the individual person, a property whose essence is independence, human freedom is a certain kind of interdependence and interaction between the individual person and the world around him. It involves a dependence upon and even an actual merging with the impending environment. Freedom, too, must be regarded not as an entity, not as a specific right or property, but as a relationship, a certain kind of relationship. There are, of course, relationships that are wholly external and conflicting, like, like two billiard balls colliding. But human freedom is not of that kind. It is an internal relationship insofar as it consists of an actual interpenetration of self and world. In, in some, human freedom is a harmonious, active, internal relationship between self and world, all of which gives the lie to the assertion, which is the political conservative's major premise, that pure self-interest, selfishness, is the ultimate motivator of all human behavior. Human beings are selfish, God knows, but human beings are also generous. And, it, and, if, and, if, uh, and if at crucial moments their generosity did not exceed their selfishness, if the instinct for cooperation did not overrule the instinct for competitive uh, acquisition, no free, no, no, uh, no, uh, uh, free society, no civilization even could have begun to begin. We have only to remember how Manhattan responded to the flood last year uh, to realize that in times of crisis, the generous overcomes the selfishness in us. It is not only then for reasons of enlightened self-interest, enlightened selfishness, it's not because we passionately care about ourselves that we individual human beings join together in the kind of social compact from which democratic government emerges. We also do so because we care about each other and the general welfare. We do so because in our best moments we realize deep down that each of us is a part of others as others are a part of each of us. We do so because we realize, when we think deeply about it, that government, far from being the enemy of personal liberties, is the only means by which true individual freedom can be realized and guaranteed. And this is more emphatically true today than ever before. We live in a world whose elements are ever more closely interconnected ever more closely bound together by the products of a scientific technology that advances at a constantly accelerating rate. It is a machine-driven world in which the individual human body, physical labor, becomes steadily less important as a factor in the economy. A computerized world in which even the individual mind becomes, as, as an economic factor, steadily less important. A corporate world in which the very concept of economic individualism and private profit from the ownership of the means of production is, is more, becomes increasingly meaningless. Now, in such a world, less government does not mean more freedom. It means just the opposite. We need more and better government than ever before, else we become wholly enslaved by an increasingly monstrous technology that is going rapidly out of rational, humane control, if indeed it is not already out of control. And especially is this true in the crucial field of mass communications. You'll understand, of course, that, that when, I, uh, when I say government, I mean democratic government. For democracy is the only form of government that takes account of 
and is designed to facilitate the realization of the whole human person. That is the individual both in his physical or spatial dimension and in his temporal or spiritual dimension. Man as body and man as spirit. The concept of the whole person, body and mind, resided, if, if rather vaguely, over the, the shaping, the initial shaping of the U.S. Constitution. Especially the preamble, with its emphasis on union, upon the establishment of justice, and upon the promotion of the general welfare in order to secure the blessings of liberty for the citizenry in general and for each of us individually. The concept was clarified and balanced by the first 10 amendments. The Bill of Rights with its stress on the individual and upon individualism. Then there was thus projected a society in which every citizen is presumed to play in political life a dual role. He is ruled by the state, but he is also a ruler of the state. Now in the former role, as one who is ruled by the state, <clears throat> He is man as body and requires only such information as, as directs his activities in obedience to the law. But in the latter role, that of governor or lawmaker, he is intensely active. He is man as spirit, requiring unlimited access to factual information, ideas, opinions on public questions. In this role, he is under an obligation to publish his own considered opinions as widely and persuasively as possible, not only because his doing so is of the essence of his functioning as a free person, but also because it is necessary that others in their capacity as rulers, as, as lawmakers, should know what he thinks. He, he is under an equal ob obligation to listen to the opinions of others, even if, if not especially to the opinions he abhors and in public debate most vehemently opposes. Each citizen, in sum, must have the news of what his fellows are, are doing, thinking, feeling, and he must have it as pure as possible, as little distorted as possible by special private interests. Now this was the reasoning behind the First Amendment with this clearly implied separation of church and state and its explicit guarantee of free individual expression. The dictum that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech and press had its motive in the conviction that these essential liberties, being both a principal source and an end of government, an end of government, cannot themselves be the proper objects of governmental regulatory power. Indeed, uh, Thomas Jefferson went so far in, that, in this conviction as to assert on one, condition, one, one occasion that if he had to choose between government without newspapers and newspapers without government, he one would unhesitatingly uh, choose the latter. He and his colleagues regarded government as a chief and indeed only serious threat to press freedom. They'd just gone through a revolution against George III, remember? And they, and, and, uh, and, uh, they were bequeathed to us, I think, a very healthy uh, uh, fear in this respect. And we do well to continue it and to express it strongly whenever a president argues that our national security requires popular ignorance of executive policy and, and action. Such decisions and action as produced the Bay of Pigs debacle, the Bay of Tonkin resolution, the active involvement of the CIA in the subversion of democratic government in Haiti, and of course the Iran's Contra scandal. And yet, paradoxically, this very suspicion of government as a potential threat to freedom has operated during recent decades in such a way as to lessen the freedom of press 
and speech. It has helped to prevent a consideration of governmental measures which would ensure a greater diversity of news sources and a freer competition of opinions and ideas. Governmental measures that would reduce the number of distortions of fact, of suppressions of factual information, and of outright falsehoods that now disgrace so many of our journals and radio and TV broadcasts as they deal with public affairs. For the blunt truth of the matter is that our newspapers today, our mass communications in general today, and especially our electronic media, TV and, and radio, these are not free in the sense in which Thomas Jefferson and the other founding fathers intended that the press should be. They have remained largely free of governmental controls and restrictions, but they have become involved in another bondage. They are in bondage to commerce. They have become big business. Now, no man or a group of men can be held morally responsible for this development. It was a consequence of technological advance. Back in Jefferson's day, all that was materially needed to start a newspaper was the traditional shirt tail full of type, a cheap hand press, and paper, and ink. A few hundred dollars sufficed even for the founding of a metropolitan daily in the early 19th century. James Gordon Bennett uh, launched his New York Herald in, in 1835 with just $500. Horace Greeley launched the New York Tribune in the early, in, 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 uh, in uh, well, I don't know when it was. I don't have it down here. <laughs> Horace Greeley launched the New York Tribune. I think it was in, eight, it was actually, it was 1841, for only $1,000. Well, thereafter, the cost rose steeply as, the, as technological advance increased the size and complexity of presses, of wire service, deliveries, and so forth. When Henry, Ray, Henry Raymond uh, launched the New York Times in 1851, he had behind him a capital of $100,000. And the trend continued thereafter inexorably. Yet even as late as 1900, it was possible to launch, a success, launch with success a small town daily with a few thousand dollars. That once very famous Kansan William Allen White purchased his Emporia Gazette for $3,000 in 1895. And I remember vividly, uh, this is how ancient I've become, I, I remember vividly a day 50 years ago when he talked to me of the impact that technological advance had had upon his own newspaper operation. While showing me through his plant, he told me that in the year of his purchase and for years thereafter, he could perform every operation of his paper's publication. He could set the type, make up the forms, and run the presses, as well as write the copy. He could, and, but now, he said, and rather sadly, as he opened the door to the composing room, now, he said, when I cross this threshold, I'm a stranger in a strange land. And he went on to say that instead of $3,000, it would cost at least $100,000 to launch a daily in a town like Emporia. Well, that was way back in, in the early 1940s. It would cost 10 times as much today. The increasingly large capital outlays that were required to launch and run a newspaper or magazine meant that a larger and larger proportion of the journal's total income must come not from subscri subscriptions but, but from advertising. Yet the advertising revenue was itself dependent or closely tied upon circulation. This meant that a paper or magazine that had formerly survived uh, profitably with a few thousand subscribers must now have scores or even hundreds of thousands of subscribers, which in turn meant the death of hundreds of periodicals and, and, a dra and thereby a, a drastic shrinkage in the diversity of information sources and a drastic increase of mental standardization. One aspect of the human freedom I've so laboriously uh, tried to define is the capacity to choose. Freedom is often defined exclusively as the capacity for choice. 
And this capacity has obviously a, a double nature. Not only it has an inner requirement and an outer requirement. Not only must the individual person be uncoerced, not only must he possess within himself a capacity to choose, he must, all, he must also live in an environment containing objects, a number of different objects, among which choices may be made. You can very effectively enslave people if you have the power to remove from their environment all objects, save, save the, the to, all objects among which you might choose, save the objects that you happen to want them to choose. Early in this century, most American towns had several daily newspapers that were independently owned, uh, different from each other in editorial policy, and often opposed on local, state, and national political issues. The reader was free to choose among them. When the number of such papers was reduced from, say, five to three, which was about the proportion of reduction in the late 20s and early 30s, the individual reader lost two-thirds of his freedom in this respect. Soon thereafter, in a typical American town, he lost it all. He could buy one local newspaper or none. And if the one were not part of a chain whose editorial policy was dictated in a central office, as quite often it was, it certainly was made up for the most part of wire service and nationally syndicated copy. Hence, the reader was likely to gain but little in diversity of news and opinion, even if he sought out and bought, uh, sub subscribed to newspapers in, in towns other than his own. The same was true of national magazines. Well, I happen to be a, a writer by profession, a freelance writer. I really have never actually been a professor. And like all my kind and generation, I cannot view without a shudder the corpses of once flourishing general circulation magazines which litter the landscape of my past. Magazines I read as a boy and to which I might have contributed articles and fiction uh, had they survived. Delineator, Pictorial Review, Saturday Evening Post, Collier's Outlook, Sensory, Forum, Scribner's, Bookman, Saturday Review of Literature, these are among the casualties uh, of, of the marketplace within the period of my memory. And many of them died when they, well, their circulations were above a million. Nor can one comfort himself with assurance that the best newspapers, the best magazines, were invariably the ones that won out in journalistic competition. Not as the best be defined as, as a literary uh, excellence and, 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 uh, and journalistic excellence. Sometimes they were the best. Now here in Manhattan, uh, there were three daily newspapers when I was very young, two evening papers and a morning one. And the one that survived and developed into the present day Manhattan Mercury was, I think, the best. The fact that the Mercury is, in my view, a very, very good home, uh, small town paper, uh, if you'll pardon a per personal reference, that fact was a major factor in my decision to return here after a long life lived elsewhere. But the best has not always or even generally prevailed. Delineator and pictorial review were the best of the women's general circulation magazines in the years just preceding their deaths. The Boston Transcript was certainly not the worst of its people, its, its town's uh, uh, sad array of dailies. And the old New York Herald, uh, no, not the Herald, <laughs> the old New York World was far and away the best of that other Manhattan's evening dailies. Both nevertheless died early in my life. It has sometimes seemed to me that a kind of Gresham's law operates among competing mass media as it does among competing currencies. Cheap journalism drives out good. The more probable truth, however, is that the quality of its journalism has relatively little to do with a mass publication survival in the marketplace. 
provided this quality does not deviate too widely fr from the norm. More important are the size of the publication's capital resources and the aggressive skills of its advertising and circulation departments. <clears throat> At any rate, in the journals that survived, the business office increasingly dominated the management of the total enterprise. Generally, the businessman owner of the periodical or of the broadcasting uh, station after radio came in was not himself competent as a journalist, as a communicator. Neither was he competent in many cases to direct in the ways needed by a free society the activities of those who did possess communicative talents and skills. He himself was in bondage to the necessities for mass circulation, mass listening viewing audiences. And in any direct conflict of values, his basic personal commitment to money making was all too likely to prevail over whatever drives he might have toward telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth on public questions. All of which led finally in the field of journalism to what has often seemed to me a typical and tragic consequence of technological advance. That is technological advance within a profit motive economy. It has led to a divorcement of power from intelligence. The divorce has not been amicable, certainly not on the part of the professional communicator, the news gatherer and purveyor, the, the uh, idea shaper, the, the opinion maker. William Allen White once recorded, as, as vividly as anyone has done, the bitterness engendered in, in the best journalists as their professional field was taken over by businessmen. One of the earliest and most effective of these last in the early 19th century was, was Frank Muncy, whose uh, special talent, which he exercised fully, I may say, was the buying up of newspapers and magazines in order to kill them off with profit for himself. He murdered for profits some 22 newspapers and magazines before he died. And when he died, White wrote of him in an editorial, which I quote in full. Frank Muncy, the great publisher, is dead. Frank Muncy contributed to the journalism of his day, the talent of a meat packer, the morals of a money changer, and the manners of an undertaker. <laughs> he and his kind have about succeeded in transforming a once noble profession into an 8% security. May he rest in trust. <laughs> now what is being pointed out here, in my opinion, is a tragic flaw at the very heart of our present mass media arrangements, namely a confusion of things with ideas, of men as bodies with men as spirits. In our, in our communications with one another, we are continuously concerned with questions of truth or falsity. And these are questions that can be asked only of ideas, never of things. A thing, let's say a table or a chair, is neither true or false. It, it simply is. It exists. One can, <clears throat> only of our ideas about things, about tables and chairs and automobiles, only about our ideas of these can we ask whether they are true or false. Truth is exclusively a quality of ideas. Yet our present mass media arrangements assume that news and opinion, ideas and emotions, values and viewpoints, that these are properly articles of commerce like groceries or automobiles or petroleum or pig iron, which may be properly bought and sold. Our arrangements assume that a spiritual enterprise dealing with such qualities of human character as, as generosity and, and, and uh, as, as, as generosity and, and faith and so on, that these, <clears throat> that these are material things which can properly be dealt with as, as, as a bin of business enterprise. In actual fact, of course, the buying and selling 
of news and ideas and opinions tends to destroy the value of what is bought and sold. To the extent that it subordinates disinterested intelligence to a shrewdly acquisitive selfishness, it makes the news suspect, it makes the ideas suspect, it makes expressed, opinion on, uh, expressed opinions on public affairs especially suspect. <clears throat> Since that opinion is often shaped not by perceived truth and a commitment to the general welfare, but by the businessman's commitment to the bottom line, as he calls it. A result is that bleak, debilitating cynicism which characterized, characterized many of the news and editorial rooms in our country when I was young, and which in the decades since has operated to keep some of our best writing talents, our most sensitive minds, out, out of journalism altogether. There are so few mass media operations in which a sensitive moral intelligence can engage with complete comfort. Thus, the disastrous split I have indicated, the divorcement of power from intelligence in precisely that area of our national life most important to self-government. And now, reluctantly, for it's hard to do so without spluttering, uh, I, I, I must turn my attention from the print media, which I've been concentrating on, to the electronic media. Here, every evil that I've been explore, deploring is magnified by a factor of about 10. Nor is this a, a, a electronic evil inadvertent, an unforeseen consequence of, of technological advance, as it so largely was in the case of print journalism. It was more than vaguely seen and warned against when radio technology was being perfected in the early 1920s. <clears throat> After control of, of American long distance uh, uh, wireless had been transformed from the, transferred from the US Navy where it had been during World War I to a private company, the Radio Corporation of America, organized under US government auspices in 1919. This latter development, the sale of the Navy's radio rights and facilities to RCA, was opposed by the then Secretary of the Navy, Josephus Daniels. He was convinced that radio should remain in government hands and saw to it that a bill to, to accomplish this was introduced in Congress. But the Republicans controlled Congress in 1919. They gained control of the White House in, in, with Harding's 1920 election. They were very pro-business Republicans. And the bill Daniels favored got nowhere. Yet the general assumption at that time, shared by, by most Republicans, was that radio waves, that's Hertzian waves as they called them then, being more than universal even than the air we breathe, should not and must not be parceled out in wavelengths as the exclusive permanent items of private property. They properly belonged to all citizens. When the government assigns specific wavelengths to specific private stations, it must do so and assure their use, not only uh, use only in the public interest. Government through its licensing of stations to broadcast and through the accompanying regulatory power should and would, it was thought, achieve this end. On one thing, practically everyone agreed. Radio should not be used for commercial advertising. Newspapers and magazine owners had selfish motives for this. They feared the effect that radio would have upon their journal's uh, advertising revenue. Others, concerned only for the general welfare, feared the impact that radio huckstering would have on American culture and the public mind. There was a strong initial effort to tie radio into America's overall educational enterprise. Colleges and universities, including Kansas State, were among the most ardent pioneers uh, of radio in America, radio broadcasting. And for a brief time, these educational stations constituted a considerable segment 
of the total, uh, of the total broadcasting enterprise. During this time, conservatives were, mo were almost as vocal as liberals in their opposition to radio advertising. In early 1922, Herbert Hoover, who was then Secretary of Commerce, declared, that, declared it to be inconceivable that we should allow so great a possibility for public service as radio presents to, to be drowned in advertising chatter. Two years later, Bruce Blivin told the readers of Century Magazine that the use of radio for advertising is wholly undesirable and should be prohibited by legislation if necessary. Congressman Saul Bloom, a Democrat from New York, announced in 1925 his sponsorship of legislation that would ban radio advertising. And the later very famous and conservative H.V. Uh, Kaltenborn delivered in that same year an anti-advertising lecture entitled Radio, Profit, or Profiteer. But as Eric Barnault writes in his superb three-volume history of broadcasting, much of this opposition was ambiguous and because of its ambiguity failed to close the door tightly against radio huckstering. Herbert Hoover, Calton Bourne, and others made a distinction between direct and indirect advertising. The former consisting of sales patter on, on behalf of specific consumer products, the latter consisting of the name sponsorship by, by, uh, by business corporations of cultural broadcasts, such broadcasts of opera and, and uh, symphony. This indirect advertising was deemed permissible. And into the crack thus left open in the door, the businessman uh, stuck his toe. The businessman, that is, who, who, uh, who accurate, accurately assessed radio's uh, potential as a market medium. Thereafter, by various devices, this businessman opened the door ever widely, while simultaneously weakening or frustrating altogether every governmental effort to regulate his enterprise. He did so, of course, in the name of freedom, of liberty. There were repeated references to the First Amendment and much creative interpretation of that men amendment. A Congressional Act, the Radio Act of 1927, was passed <clears throat> establishing a five-member Federal Radio Commission, FRC, with a limited authority to grant or refuse licenses in the public interest. But in 1927, the man in the White House was, was Calvin Coolidge, who told the world that the business of America is business. The radio law focused on individual broadcasting stations. Its wording failed to take into account the, the networks, which were then uh, rapidly forming. And the sternness of the new commission's regulation of radio commercialism can be judged by the fact that one of the initial appointees was, was a man who had founded a magazine, Radio uh, Retailing, which had editorially opposed passage of the act under which he now operated. And another early appointee was a man from our own town, Sam Pickard, a Kansas State graduate who served as an FRC commissioner for a year or so, presumably regulating such commercial enterprises as CBS, and then resigned to become himself a vice president of CBS and subsequently a millionaire. By the early 1930s, the do door that had been left open a crack in the early 1920s was wide open to a flood of lowest common denominator vulgarity, while educational broadcast had been enfeebled almost to impotency by inadequate financing and poor channel assignments. The broadcast commercial became an ever more insistent and ever more nauseating fact of national life. Now, some effort was made to improve, this, improve the situation during the first New Deal years. The Roosevelt administration sponsored a congressional bill to abolish the, by then, utterly discredited Federal Radio Commission and replace it with a seven-member Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, and having somewhat greater authority 
to operate against the increasingly great concentration of radio ownership and control in ever fewer hands, though with very slight uh, control over the content of radio programs, over the allocation of time between public service broadcasting and private interest broadcasting, or between <clears throat> programs geared to the lowest common denominator and programs appealing to more elevated and informed tastes. This new commission, within 90 days after its establishment, was to redistribute the, the radio channels. And an amendment to the bill, proposed by New York Senator Wagner, would have required the FCC to allot one-fourth of the channels to educational, religious, agricultural, labor, cooperative, and similar nonprofit licensees. <clears throat> but it would also permit these nonprofit licensees to sell enough of their allotted time to make the stations financially self-supporting. And this, that is the permission to sell time, <clears throat> aroused a sharp, uh, caused a very sharp division within the ranks of the educators themselves. They had organized in 1930 a National Committee on Education by Radio to lobby for their cause. But the disagreement of many of them with, over the time selling clause enfeebled their lobbying effort in the face of a powerful broadcasting industry that was united as never before. The amendment was defeated by a vote of 42 to 23 in the Senate. The Communications Act of 1934 was passed without it, and the FCC then proved over the years little more, if any more effective, as a regulatory agency than the old NRC had been, or FRC. Yet the need for more, rather than, than less governmental controls over broadcasting, controls in service of the general welfare of genuine individual human freedom, this need grew almost exponentially as, as the television technology advanced by leaps and bounds through the, old, through, through the mid and, and late 1930s. It was clear to those concerned with such matters that TV was destined to have, within a decade or so, an even greater impact on America's mental life, America's cultural life, than radio had had. I remember the dread aroused in me as a very young, young man. I was myself then a, a working journalist doing press and radio for the Soil Conservation Service. My dread as I read of the progress of television technology and viewed the prospect of its operation as an advertising medium. This dread was only somewhat less great than that of the war, than just beginning. I remember, too, my wonder and dismay that New Deal reformers gave so little heed to mass communications developments which people like me saw as terrifying. This despite the fact that most of the business-dominated press and radio of that era was bitterly hostile to Roosevelt and the New Deal and widely uh, unfair and dishonest in its reporting of these. For it, was, for it was perfectly obvious that the American experience of radio under the businessman's control foretold what would happen if or when the still more marvelous and powerful technology of television came under the same dominion. For one thing, hundreds more newspapers and dozens more general circulation magazines would be forced to suspend publication as commercial television drained away from the print media an increasingly uh, large proportion of the advertising budgets of firms that made and sold consumer goods. This would have sorry effects upon the public mind, in my opinion. I was very sure that images on a viewing screen could not possibly convey by themselves the kind of information nor stimulate the kind of thinking that printed words can convey and that the self-governing citizens of a democratic society must have and do. Marshall McLuhan, to the contrary notwithstanding, the human line, mind can think straight only linearly in, in lines. 
Indeed, the vivid impact of images on a screen might often convey just by themselves false information while drowning <coughs> thought processes in purely emotional reactions. Certainly the crushing impact of the lowest common denominator on, on American culture and political life would be immensely increased by the addition of sight to sound over the airwaves. To realize this, one had only to look at the tremendous augmentation of vivid impact and attention abs absor absorption that accrued to the motion picture when soundtracks were added to reels. But progress, as people say, is inevitable. Commercial television came upon us, and its effect upon our democracy has been, if anything, more evil from my point of view than the effect some of us anticipated when I was young. Indeed, as, as my long-suffering wife well and sadly knows, I'm inclined to see commercial TV as one root of almost every evil that now plagues our society. Overall, its, uh, its effect has been to augment vastly the skillful, massive, and, and continuous assault that the advertising <coughs> industry has made upon our minds and characters, upon our aesthetic tastes, our moral values. Day in and day out, advertising now floods into us through every portal of perception. It is insidious, it is inescapable, and its overwhelming tendency is toward the destruction of precisely those qualities of mind, of spirit, which are the most essential to the functioning of a free society. A critical intelligence that is accurately informed, a discriminating taste, an ability to fuse logic with emotion in a way, in such a way as to make sound value judgments, an acute moral sense sustaining a commitment to the general welfare, a profound respect for the integrity of the word, an equally profound abhorrence of falsehood deliberately employed for private gain. These are what a healthy democracy requires of its citizens. The development of them in the individual person is a principal aim of education for democracy. Yet these, to the extent that they are deemed to constitute sales resistance, are what the site advertiser tries to destroy within a specific target area. His aim is to spread across the cultural landscape a climate of bland acquiescence in which the critical faculties are put to sleep the self-discipline which in, inhibits appetite is relaxed, and effortful commitments to the general welfare are supported, subordinated to a private pleasure and comfort-seeking selfishness whose satisfaction demands an unending and accelerating consumption of goods. Now that's a general effect. More specifically, commercial TV has to a measurable extent distorted our national income pattern, diverting to the advertising and entertainment industries, economically unproductive industries, billions upon billions that might otherwise help alleviate poverty, help uh, ho house the homeless, and upgrade the country's uh, infrastructure, properly educate the young, and so on. It has had some notoriously deleterious effects upon the education of our young lessening their attention spans and capacity to concentrate, encouraging raw sex and brutal violence, inculcating selfishly materialistic values, stealing from them time that might otherwise be devoted to reading, study, and healthful exercise. Commercial TV's big money, coupled with the arrogant greed of commercial TV's ownership and control, has had corrupting effects upon professional sports, is the root cause of the current baseball strike and of the probably coming strikes in, foot, in football and baseball, I mean, and basketball. It has vastly increased the corruption of intercollegiate sports, a corruption that was, was uh, quite bad in the 1920s. Far more serious is the corrupting effect that commercial TV has had and increasingly has upon American political life. Every national election campaign since the 1950s 
has been a frightening demonstration of how, in the present state of our mass communications, manipulation tends to replace information, ideas are debased into slogans, and candidates, those that are willing to lend themselves to the process, are merchandised like breakfast food as we, the people, go through the motions of selecting our president, our governor, our congressional representatives, our state legislators. Professional politicians in office are very widely perceived as bought and paid for agents of special interests. And thanks to commercial TV, they all too often are. People running for state or national office are strongly tempted, if not compelled, to sell out to special interests in order to obtain the obscenely large sums of money required to buy TV time. And they have to have TV time if they're going to win elections. I frankly don't see how meaningful campaign reform can be achieved so long as commercial TV dominates mass communications. Well, can anything be done about this? And if so, what should it be? As regards the first question, my, my answer has to be that I, I don't know. It's a catch-22 question. Certainly nothing will be done about it unless the general public becomes well-informed and concerned about it. We can become well-informed about it only through mass communications. And the owners and present owners and controllers of our mass communications don't want us to be informed about it, much less think about it. But as regards the second question, what should be done, what should be done, what, not just what ought to be, I, I uh, have a few tentative suggestions. It is obvious that if the problem is to become widely recognized and then solved, it can be only through government. In this field of mass communications, it is, it is especially true that government, democratic government is the only means by which true individual freedom can be realized and guaranteed. I suppose some effort should be made to realize whatever possibilities exist for self-discipline, self-regulation, uh, self-dedication to their proper functions by the present owners of the means of communication, by the present users of these, and by the professional communicators. Each of these groups has formed private organizations whose members are publicly pledged to ethical standards of the highest order. These organizations could certainly do more than they have done to ensure that the standards are lived up to in actual practice. The organizations do have power of, public, of publicized approval and disapproval of the performance, performance of their members. They have powers of reward or expulsion. But I'm afraid I have no faith in self-regulation as a solution of a problem. I have somewhat more faith, but not a great deal more, in the possibilities of governmental regulation, regulation aimed toward more freedom of press and speech through such agencies as the Federal uh, Communications Commission, the Federal Trade Commission, and the Interstate Commerce Commission. The history of these agents, agencies, or of, of regulatory agencies in general, is not such as to breed great hope of effectiveness. Quite generally through the years, the so-called regulators have been coerced or bribed directly and indirectly into the service of those they are allegedly regulating. They all too often go like, like Sam Pickard did from their posts in a regulating agency to much higher paying ones in the business they had presumably regulated. I suppose it is, I suppose it is possible that these agencies could become more effective if they operated under legislation that made a sharp, clear distinction between the physical means of communication and the content of communications, between body and mind, so to speak, and then forbade the owners of the means of communication and the advertisers who use these facilities to have any more control over the content of news reports, of opinion reports, and, and, and of radio and TV programming than the ordinary citizen has. The FCC is now specifically denied any power of, of, of censorship or direct control over radio program uh, content, and I think it should be. It can legally consider the merit of programs 
when passing upon applications for renewal of their licenses. It did so in the case of, of our own Goat Gland Doc Brinkley long ago, denying him a, a station, station license when it came up for renewal. But this licensing power is clearly more nominal than actual when the, C, when the FCC comes up against really powerful commercial interests. Indeed, the licensing power in this field seems to have atrophied so much from disuse that, that it has become almost extinct. It is not being used to any perceptible effect against the utterly terrifying growth uh, over the year, uh, utterly terrifying growth toward communications corporations, uh, monopolies that include not only radio and TV, but also newspapers, magazines, books, TV. And this despite the fact that the FCC, along with the FTC, has under the Sherman Antitrust Act legal authority to do so. So far as I can see, absolutely nothing effective is being done to protect us citizens against Rupert Mur Murdoch, who's as vicious an enemy of good journalism and human freedom as is now operating in America. Actually, he operates globally. But if the businessman, the newspaper owner, the magazine owner, the station owner, the advertiser, if he is not to control communications content, then who is, in my opinion? Well, as a writer by profession, uh, but I don't think solely for that reason, I'm convinced that the control of the content of mass communications should be in the hands of professional communicators. Among professional communicators, I include not only writers and journalists, but editors, performing artists, theatrical directors. They, I think, should control what is said and done through our mass communications facilities. Men and women who are dedicated to their communications profession and to the highest standards of that profession in the same way as a painter is dedicated to, to his art, or a highly skilled craftsman to his craft, a medical doctor to medicine, insofar as he is not himself a businessman, and an educator to, to education. And that last, my mention of education, suggests one step it may be possible, if extremely difficult, for us to take through government toward the freeing of mass communications from their present economic bondage. We must, of course, be deeply concerned to avoid replacing the, temp the, the, the present bondage with an even worse bureaucratic political control. No one in his right mind, uh, no Democrat, a small d Democrat, <coughs> would, 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 replace the, would replace the present bondage with an even worse uh, uh, bureaucratic uh, political control. No one in his right mind wants government censorship of the news or a, mass, or, or a mass communication system that operates as a propaganda arm of our government's executive branch. But we might and should vastly increase the federal funding to public, of public radio and TV and join an even larger portion of it than is now joined to our educational system make it a con to a considerable degree, degree an integral part of our educational system. Our public radio and TV should be expanded 10 times, could, could be expanded 10 times uh, at a cost to the taxpayers, uh, 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 what it costs the taxpayers to clean up just one SNL mess. And the benefit to taxpayers, the increased service to the general welfare would be immense. Right now, of course, we're going the other way. The Republican administrations, in their wisdom, beginning with Nixon, have quite steadily reduced the federal funding of public communications, so that we now have increasingly commercials at the beginning of public broadcasts, the PBS programs. We might also federally fund general circulation newspapers and magazines as integral parts of our universities. After all, as, as my great friend and teacher, Alexander Mickeljohn, said long ago, our news reporters and editors and commentators 
are engaged in the same overall educational enterprise as our teachers are. They should operate by the same standards of scholarship, of dedication to the finding and spreading of truth, and should be protected by the same guarantees of academic freedom as our, as our communities of scholars are. But will the, the, the first step I've suggested be taken? Well, at the moment it seems, I'm sorry to say, highly unlikely. More likely, it seems a continuation and even an acceleration of what I'm convinced is a trend toward disaster for our free society, our free society. Yet hope springs eternal. And for me, it is rooted in an undiminished and unqualified faith in the, in the democracy that the wisest of our forefathers sought to bring forth on this continent. I have every faith in the capacity of ordinary citizens to make the right decisions on public questions, provided they are accurately and adequately, adequately informed on those questions. I have every faith that if they are so informed, they will see the fundamental contradiction that is inherent in our present economic arrangements, the contradiction between individual private profit as a prime economic motivation and the ever closer, ever tighter interdependencies and the consequent need for large scale and even global planning and organization, which technological, technological advance implies. I have every faith that we ordinary citizenry, if adequately informed, adequately educated, will make the fundamental structural changes that are needed to tame a monstrously growing technology and harness it to humane purposes. Changes that express and emphasize the generous, cooperative, spiritual elements of the human person instead of the selfish, acquisitive, physically appetitive elements upon which the prevailing system places its greatest emphasis. Thank you for your patience. is that they're also fighting for their lives in the light of the new information revolution, which, for example, threatens to dissolve publishing companies because things can now be published electronically and distributed for free on the internet. The question is, uh, what influence the electronic publishing that can be done by individuals on internet and so forth, how this uh, fits into the larger picture. Uh, he believes that some of these big corporations are fighting for their lives right now. Well, I, I think technological advance in that field just might provide a, a uh, an answer, but uh, it scares me that, that uh, this, uh, these technological advances now in, in internets and so forth are, are dominated pretty much by, by the same interests that dominate mass communications today. The AT&T, for instance. same line, <clears throat> the, uh, there's you know, now a third media, well, a fourth. You, you talked about newspapers and uh, radio and TV. The internet is essentially a fourth type of media, and there is growing commercial influence on the, the flow of information. Um, and
And sometimes when I'm on there and I'll see commercial advertising, I'll, re I'll be thinking that, gosh, here it goes again. This is the same thing we went through with radio and television. Is there anything we can do, especially with the internet, which is global, and there's no government control at the global level, as opposed to where on the national level we have the FCC that can control, at least have some control, there is none at the global level. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm as concerned as you are about that. I'd hope that you, you people are, you young people are much more up on, on, on communications technology, computers, and so forth than I am. I'd hope that the internet would, would get, you know, an interspice through which the kind of freedom I care about would operate, but I know that the Clinton administration is encouraging business enterprise in that field, and without controls, without that visa, I've never heard him say anything about controls, and it worries me. You know. Yes. I guess this would be in the nature of a commercial, but there is one exception to this rule of the over impact of commercialism in the growth of 50 years of uh, Consumers Union, which publishes consumer reports that accepts no advertising, takes no advertising, and does not allow products that are accepted and rated high to advertise that they are, that, uh, use that material in their uh, commercials, and uh, has achieved a uh, circulation of five million, which is higher than Time, Life, uh, Newsweek, and so forth. So uh, it's one little ray of hope that you can be successful, uh, profitably, not profitably, uh, in this arena. It really wasn't a question. He was uh, advocating, pointing out that there are uh, legitimate commercial enterprises, uh, non-profit uh, consumer reports, uh, which allows uh, doesn't take advertising and is therefore a free and independent uh, judge and critic. Yes. Have one more down here. Take one more. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I just wanted to ask, which forms of media do you suggest we, as university students and the general public, should pay attention to? I mean, yeah, which, which ones are uh, valid? Forms of media. Are say TV is the uh, one that caught our attention and seems to dominate it. Uh, getting control of TV would certainly would make politics uh, much clearer. If, for instance, we did get campaign reform so that no, no uh, uh, private money was allowed to go in campaigns, that, that all, all campaigns were financed totally by, by taxpayers' money, then I think uh, everything would be immensely improved. And certainly TV would not then be getting this gobs of money they now get out of the campaign that's going right on right now, which seems to consist mostly of name calling on 20-second news bites. what I think is the arrogant greed of TV. When, when they try to, uh, for instance, there's a book that just came, come out uh, on 
Nicole Simpson, the, the murdered girl, and Ito, the judge in, in this case, wanted to keep the jurors, the prospective jurors, from, from uh, being exposed to an interview, a TV interview, about that book. Connie Chung, I believe, was going to do it. Maybe she's probably done it. Well, immediately, the TV owners in their arrogance cited, they dared to cite the First Amendment as their right, you know, that this would be an interference, the judge was trying to interfere with, with the First Amendment. Now, in a case between justice and, 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 and First Amendment rights to, to report the news, in England, for instance, uh, justice always prevails over that, that First Amendment rights. Rights are not exclusive. You, you know, they, there are cases in which justice is more important than the free flow of information. And that's, I, I think, true in a case where a trial is about to be held. But uh, as I said, TV broadcast or will broadcast that interview. They've got a First Amendment right to do so, they say. He says he's tired, we'll take one more. One final question. The O.J. Simpson trial reminds me of a similarly publicized trial, the Scopes trial in Texas in 1925. What's the difference between the two? Uh, the question is, uh, he is reminded of similarities between the O.J. Simpson trial and the Scopes trial. If you'd like to comment on any differences you see between the two. Well, I don't think that those are two are, 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 are very comparable. What's more comparable would be the O.J. Simpson trial and the Bruno Hoffman trial for the kidnapping and murder of the Lindbergh baby. I don't know what that's the question about. You want to know if you saw similarities between the two? Not, not too much in the Darrow trial, no. I think the issues there were pretty well presented. In fact, they so humiliated William Jennings Bryan that he died a couple of, three or four days later. Some people say because he ate too much fried chicken, but I think partly, <laughs> I think it was partly that, that he was pretty crushed by what Darrow did to him in the Scopes trial. All right, thank you very much for coming.